Welcome, everybody, to another week of uh, Life with Dr. McDougall. And today is the first webinar of the year, 2017. And today we have a special webinar because Dr. John McDougall is joined by his lovely wife, Mary McDougall. And they will talk about what their hopes are for this year. And, and I think Dr. McDougall also wants to talk about the newsletter that I I read and it was very enlightening and he, as a tribute to Dr. Henry Heimlich. So we're excited. Thank you all for being here. I'm Gustavo Tolosa, as you, you all know me, and I'm, I'm honored to be hosting this webinar. How are you both doing, Dr. McDougall and Mary? We're doing just great. We're doing great. Yeah. You know, uh, Gustavo, I, I don't know how well this will go. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I asked Mary to join me for the whole webinar today. <clears throat> At the last minute, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, for some of you, I, this may be a worthwhile conversation. For others of you, you may decide that this is not why you tuned in. But uh, Mary and I, I want to talk a little bit about uh, Mary and I today and, and our lives together. And it's uh, very appropriate because... Uh, our uh, 45th anniversary will be in three days. No, not 45? Yeah, it seems, oh, it seems man, longer. The huh? <laughs> no, the years have gone by too fast. We were married in 1972. Right. Oh, oh geez, I thought we were only 43 this year. <laughs> 45, wow. So well, that's our 45th good time. anniversary on uh, Sunday. Sunday. And uh, we had a great opportunity that day to uh, be working. Uh, we're running a 10-day program, and it's just like on my birthday. Uh, I want to work that day, and uh, it took for us to work together on our anniversary, uh, running a 10-day program with about 40 people, a little over 40, I guess, uh, is, is going to be a real opportunity. But you know, I just thought I would, uh, with Mary here, so she can correct all my uh, <laughs> misunderstandings, I thought maybe we'd just take a, a few minutes and, and tell you about, and I don't know how long this will stretch, and how interesting you'll find it, but kind of tell you why, uh, what happened from our point of view over the last 45 years. Uh, I was uh, in medical school at Michigan State University, and part of our opportunity as uh, third and fourth year medical students was to go to other cities in the state of Michigan and to work in their hospitals. And so I went to Flint, Michigan, uh, probably Saginaw, Michigan, and practiced a little bit in East Lansing where our medical school was. And then I had a rotation in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And uh, that's- Well, don't when, forget to tell them you were in surgery at that time. No, I was still in medical school. Well, you weren't doing, but you were doing a surgical rotation. Well, part of my part of my time at to see, there's gonna be a lot of corrections here. <laughs> You'll see a lot of bantering going on in the last hour, so be prepared. But it's been 45 years since she put up with me, so. Uh, I was in a senior year and yeah, I was uh, on a surgical rotation. And uh, so that's what we met. And what were you doing at that time before you met me? I was working as a private scrub nurse for a very famous orthopedic surgeon. Um, his name was um, Al Swanson. And he is the man who invented silicone joints to replace uh, rheumatoid arthritis um, joints that were deformed beyond um, correction. And he made silicone joints and we would take out the old joints and put silicone joints in to their fingers so that they could actually move them again. And, and um, so that's what I was doing. Every, well, I, I did um, hip pinnings and other orthopedic um, procedures that he did also, but that's what he was famous for. And, and Alan B. Swanson, again, was world famous. He had 176 clinics. And he was an extremely difficult man. <laughs> like any genius, you know, he had his flaws. I mean, this man literally threw people out of the operating room. And he and, threw instruments. And threw instruments and <laughs> would not allow anybody to touch his patients except for him. Even in his advanced residence, uh, they, were, they were rarely allowed to touch the patient's tissues. Right. And nobody could get along with Alan B. Swanson, except, except for Mary. For me. <laughs> yeah. He loved Mary, and because she did such a great job at uh, making sure his uh, operating room was organized and uh, uh, functioned well. Uh, so 
you know, that, that tells you a little bit about my, Mary's personality and her <laughs> ability to put up with me for 45 years. Do you, do you remember the first time we met? It probably wasn't even important to you, but. Well, the other thing I remember is, is what well, we were pinning hip together. You, but you remember another time before that? No, no, that's the time I remember. And, uh, and I didn't see anything about you except, you know, your eyes and a masked face. And Well, hip pinnings back in those days used to be much different than they are today. And you sliced a big scar open on their hip. I don't know, I don't know what they are like today, but you sliced a big scar open on their hip and you, you chiseled the hip bone out and you took everything out and then you had to put this big um silver ball back into the joint yeah, well, that was the replacement and then you had to have um uh, all these uh screws and um nail well not nails nail screws and a big plate a metal plate along their hip yeah they all kinds of things and things are much different these days yeah so that's where we met and uh and uh you know, I, I of course was very attracted and i asked you out at that time, I was uh, looking for uh, <clears throat> internships around the country, and uh, I was traveling a little bit. But you know, I very directly asked if you'd go out with me. And <laughs> you didn't have time or any interest or anything. It took me almost three weeks before I could get a date. But uh, we hit it off very well, and uh, fact so well that uh, you know, probably from that that day in September. 1971 forward, we were we were uh, you know a team together, <clears throat> and uh, as I've told many of you before, when Mary and I were together before we were married, uh, in December of 1971, my eyes were opened by Dr. Dennis Burkett. Uh, this wow. is the fiber man who studied who actually worked in Uganda and found no none of the Western diseases among uh, 10 million Ugandans that he took care of uh, for 17 years at the head of the Ministries of Health and. And I remember in our very humble apartment. In fact, it was really disgusting. Wasn't it? Humble is right. I can't believe you, that you would even join me for dinner there. But uh, we, uh, I came home and I told Mary that we're not, you know, I heard about fiber. We're not going to eat white bread anymore. We're going to eat brown bread with our bacon and eggs. And you, you started doing some cooking for me then. You got to tell, you got to tell people what a, Interesting experience it was cooking for John well, McDougall. <laughs> well, I grew up in a family where my mother was really not a cook, so I never learned how to cook when I was a child. Um, we ate very basic foods, uh, lots of casseroles and things like that. Um, once in a while, we would have meat as a centerpiece, but not often. We never had eggs for breakfast. Breakfast was always cold cereal and milk and maybe a piece of fruit. If we ever had eggs, it was um, maybe once a month and they were for dinner. So um, I grew up eating the American diet. It wasn't like we didn't eat dairy or cheese or or meat or anything else, but it wasn't the same kind of diet that John ate, which was the big piece of meat on the plate for dinner with some mashed potatoes and gravy and eggs for breakfast every morning and things like that. And I can still remember after we got married and he asked me for eggs for breakfast and bacon. And I was just shocked. I said, people eat eggs for breakfast? And then he wanted six of them. Oh, come on. oh, you did too. Yeah. And a whole bunch of bacon. And um, so we were, so the white bread thing was um, not really a big deal. I mean, we didn't eat that much bread. And, and I'm sure the wheat bread that we bought at that time was not the kind of wheat bread that we would recommend to people these days. We just bought brown bread. That was probably dyed brown. I didn't know how to read labels back then. Right. So do you remember um, the oven blowing up? I do remember the oven blowing up. I don't remember what I was trying to make. We had such an old oven in this grungy <laughs> apartment that I was in the oven trying to light it and it blew up in my face and it singed all my eyelashes and my eyebrows off. Um, 
So that's kind of where we started in terms of our eating. Uh, both of us uh, had been raised in Michigan and we were anxious. At that time, I, I was applying for internships and the way you did it with a matching system, you listed various um, internships you'd like to go to. And then the internships uh, at various places decided whether they wanted you as a matching program. And I applied for some big name hospitals uh, uh, in San Francisco and LA County. And you know the really top notch hospitals where real doctors go to train. And uh, then when Mary and I met, we kind of talked about having a life in Los Angeles or San Francisco and where we really ought to move. And I guess both <laughs> of us were uh, were idealist or uh, adventuresome and dreamers. And no, I just didn't want him to work that hard. I knew how long he, how long the hours were going to be at those hospitals that he applied at. He was going to be gone for days at a time and he was going to be working overnight and I was going to be in the strange big city. And even though it was California, which was better than Michigan, it still was a big, big deal hospital. It wasn't, um, it wasn't going to be relaxed and I wasn't going to see him much. And, and I didn't really look forward to our first married year being like that. So we're married February 8th. No, January. Oh, excuse me, January. See how I'm already in trouble. <laughs> January 8th, we're three days from now, uh, 1972. So it's been 45 years. And uh, in the matching program, uh, I, of course, matched with uh, the Queens Medical Center internship, which wasn't even a university program. I mean, the uh, quality of students that went there in Honolulu to that Queens Medical Center program were not high quality students. Uh, as but as, it was Hawaii. But it was Hawaii. <laughs> And so we left, I think it was probably June of 1972, yeah. on a uh, 747 jumbo jet that had a lounge. And uh, we just kind of took off. I uh, remember telling my parents that we'd only be gone a year. And uh, we left, uh, went on Lulu, <clears throat> stayed at one of my old girlfriend's houses. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then eventually got an apartment right next to the Alamoana Center. And there we had a really fun year. You. Uh, Relaxed, read. Uh, I did not work. No, uh, if you shopped at Alamona Shopping Center, which is about 300 feet from our apartment. We didn't have any money, so I just looked. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, I, and I worked in the emergency room. I worked extra hours. Sometimes I had to work uh, all night long. And, you know, to do a 30-hour stretch was not unusual for an intern back then. Yeah. <clears throat> but we did have a lot of fun together. Uh, we were able to take a vacation to the Big Island of Hawaii. When my time as an internship ended, and I was in a surgical internship, uh, I think because I thought surgeons were macho and of course surgeons can do things and um, help people, they the, the motto goes surgeons can do, know nothing but can do everything. An internist, which I am, they know everything and you do nothing. Uh, so I envisioned myself as a surgeon. And uh, actually prior to that, when I was in medical school, I was accepted to Al Swanson's orthopedic residency program. Okay. And also another guy, do you remember his name? The uh, the big, big shot at, uh, who ran an orthopedic program. No. Charlie, you know, he did the Charlie hips. Anyway, so I, I imagine myself as a surgeon, but as I went through my year of surgical internship, which by the way was extreme, extremely painful, uh, you want to talk about physical and mental torture uh, internships back then were exactly that. So we, we finished that year of internship and we decided we did not want to leave Hawaii. We had uh, aquariums with fish where we used to go uh, catching fish with nets and put them in aquariums in our apartment. And <laughs> we, uh, I think we eventually had two cats by then. Yeah, we had two cats. So we decided we're not going to leave Hawaii. Uh, and I didn't want to continue on in my training because I didn't want to be a surgeon and uh, as I realized, I couldn't nail two boards together. And so I would have been the worst surgeon in the world. So we quit and uh, uh, started looking for jobs. And there was a job on the Big Island of Hawaii. Uh, it was as a sugar plantation doctor. <clears throat> and what this, this meant is Mary and I and our two cats and our fish. We took our fish, too. We took our fish. Uh, we, I don't uh, remember how, though. But we took them in ox bags full of oxygen. Mm -hmm. We had these amazing fish, these angler, amazing fish that we collected. I'm ashamed of that now, of what I did. But uh, we took them to the Big Island. We got a uh, job on the plantation. And they gave us a manager's house. 
Sounds great, doesn't it? Yeah, man, you, should, it was, so you should have seen it. <laughs> uh, it was uh, no heating. Uh, I don't even know if they had windows, they had screens. Well, do they have screens? We had windows, yeah, but yeah. the windows were so rattly, we had to stick clothespins in them so they wouldn't rattle. Right. Well, we, were, we, went, <laughs> we went there and we had a great time. We bought a Toyota Land Cruiser. We cruised all over the islands. Just had an amazing year for newlyweds together. Uh, and then our, and you only had to work three three hours a morning. Yeah, I had to work three hours, but, <laughs> but, but every fourth day I had to yeah, work, work all day. All day. Yeah. So it was a 24, 30 hour day. And I did everything. I mean, I uh, caught 100 babies. I did brain surgery in the middle of the night. I got called out any hour of the night or day. People would call me at four o'clock in the morning because they had crabs. <laughs> I mean, it was just, just a, an amazing experience, but a real learning experience because I had to take care of patients. And about that time, we were still eating the same way, though. We we're still eating the Western diet. And then we met Buzz and Susan after you got pregnant. Yeah. And Buzz and Susan Hughes, uh, they were the hippies that lived uh, in this community, which was north of Hilo, 60 miles, miles north of Hilo, in Honoka'a, in Pauwilo. No, they lived in Hualoa. Uh, Hualoa, okay. So they lived up on this hill, this beautiful place. And we met in a childbirth education class. And they introduced the idea that food might have something to do with disease. And I remember talking to Buzz in my office one day, and I said, how in the heck could you believe food had anything to do with disease? I said, if it had anything to do with disease, then they would have taught me about it in medical school, and they didn't. And that was my thought to him. But he challenged me. He said, well, don't you think that it's important? And that started me thinking. And we had Buzz and Susan over many times for dinner and vice versa. And they were a big influence on us. And we started changing our diet. And uh, well, we changed to organic and range fed beef and, um, you know, organic chickens. And it's, it's not like we stopped eating these things. We just, we ate a few more plants, but we still ate our meat and chicken. You know, and I remember Susan, she was pregnant and I was so concerned about her that she was going to develop calcium or protein, some other nutrient deficiency, but she wouldn't eat any meat. She was pure vegan. But what she did agree to do, because I was her doctor, she agreed to, to eat fish that I freshly speared. And that's all she would eat in terms of meat. And I don't even know whether she ate that, but at least she accepted it. Uh, right, uh, right off, uh, we lived right on the edge of a cliff, which was uh, on the Pacific Ocean. And so I would climb down the rocks on ropes and I had to climb 100 feet down a rock with my snorkel and mask and spear. I, I never watched. You went once. I went once, but otherwise I wouldn't go and watch you go down those ropes. Oh, it was, but I it, did go down those ropes one time. Yeah, it was an amazing, <laughs> an amazing experience. Uh, you know, we went into waters that only 11 people had ever gone in, to my knowledge. It was so rough and dangerous. Uh, but uh, we and it wasn't pretty. There was no coral. There were just these big rocks sitting in the sand. And, and fish, uh, there were fish. Uh, lots of fish. Lots of fish. I, was, I think they were called a lua, the big ones, which were sometimes six foot in length. And uh, then there were smaller ones, papillos and uh, uh, parrotfish and yeah. all kinds of little fish. So I would sometimes, and you know, I would go with a couple of friends, bring home a whole stringer load of fish. Again, I'm ashamed of what I did. But, uh, and there were also plenty of sharks. Uh, but anyway, Susan would said she would eat the fish. That's how concerned I was about, and how ignorant I was about nutrition back then. So we had our first child, Heather, yeah. when, we, when we lived on uh, on the Big Island, and uh, that was an interesting experience to say the least. We don't <laughs> have to go through all that, but it ended up as a natural birth, and uh, this was one of the first times we challenged established medical professions. Uh, Mary finished the delivery, which happened in Hilo. And uh, got up and got in the shower <laughs> and dressed Heather and climbed in the car and drove. Well, we had another person drive us there, but I drove 40 miles back up to Honoka where we lived so that we, same night. Yeah, so we're going in three hours, much to the distress of the they, obstetrician and they pediatrician. They were all upset. They couldn't believe. I said, well, if she's not sick. You know, I'm, I'm, she's, she's a healthy woman who just had a baby. We're going home. 
So we went home and I think all we had was lawn chairs there for furniture. Oh, yeah, we did. <laughs> and uh, so that was our first child, Heather. And uh, every, of course, everything went well, fortunately. <clears throat> and um, I worked as a plantation doctor, worked really hard. And as I say, I learned much. But I was very frustrated. I told many of you, uh, two experiences happened to me then. One is I learned what a lousy doctor I was because no, none of my patients with chronic disease could get well, even though I gave them all the drugs. And, you know, we fortunately had an amazing surgeon, uh, Paul Matsumoto, who was there who could do anything in surgery. This guy was the, the, the uh, most amazing doctor that I'd ever met. And uh, he was there to help. And uh, so I learned what a lousy doctor I was, except for acute problems, emergencies as far as chronic disease. And the second thing I learned and we learned together is how to eat. Uh, we had many Filipino patients and friends and we went to Filipino weddings and uh, you had a, uh, a caretaker to help you took care of Heather and yeah. Patrick. Who was well, you didn't talk about Patrick yet. Okay, well, next was Patrick. <laughs> and he was born in Hodogawa Hospital and I happened to be the doctor in attendance. So we were watching Star Trek and we had to finish the episode of Star Trek, so we did, because we were both Star Trek fans. But so we uh, arrived at the hospital just in time, and uh, Patrick was born, and of course we took him home right away. But that was at the local hospital, not in Hilo. But we spent three great years there. Bought a sailboat. Yeah. And sailed uh, between the islands. Uh, I had a 32-foot islander. That's one of the reasons my skin is the way it is, is because. I thought I was invincible and uh, spent my time getting burnt. Well, they didn't talk much about sunscreen back in the 70s. You know, it was it was really nothing that we were told to put on ourselves or on our kids. I mean, I don't even know if they made sunscreen in the 70s. They, they made suntan lotion, but I don't know if it had sunscreen in it. Well, we spent a lot of our free time on our sailboat with our two kids. And we took them, by the way. The two kids, we used to strap them in car seats down below the deck because the, the waves were 10, 20 feet high and the winds were 20, 30 miles an hour. And uh, we would take and sail between the islands, which are some of the of the top five toughest sailing parts of the world. And uh, we did that. <clears throat> so our, our three years uh, living on the plantation, we remember fondly. Oh, yeah. And it taught us how to eat because we learned from our Japanese, Chinese, and Filipino patients that the right diet was a diet of rice and vegetables and not meat and eggs like a, yeah but we didn't really eat that way well, we were eating range-fed beef well but about that time you know we decided to move back to oahu i applied for a medical residency now it had become john burns school of medicine the university of hawaii school of medicine and uh we took our two kids i think we had 12 cats then Oh, I think only nine. <laughs> okay, well, we didn't take. <laughs> we did. Did we take them all? Yeah, we took them all because we got that house. Well, we rented a house and we moved back to Oahu. We actually moved to Kailua. And uh, I was able to buy two cars, both for less than $900. So you know what they look like. And you know how dependable <laughs> they were. And I started uh, uh, the University of Hawaii Medical Residency Program as an internist. And Mary stayed home, uh, took care of the kids. And it was really uh, a great job on her part because I really wasn't there. I was uh, working often. I mean, every every three or four days, I'd have to put in a 30-hour days. And the other days were 12-hour days. And so she didn't uh, have my company too often. She basically raised the kids for uh, two and a half years by herself, except for me coming home in the evening, you know, maybe some Saturdays and Sundays and mm -hmm. days off. But we did change our diet then. I remember the last beef we had was in Kailua, which was probably 1976. Okay, but that was only after you had started doing your research. That was not because we learned this from the people on the Big Island. You, you, you relate now to the diet of the Big Island, but we were still eating. I remember our kids drinking dairy yeah. when they were one and two years old. And I remember still eating meat and chicken and fish um, in the beginning. It wasn't really until you started doing research that we changed 
the way we ate. Right. I, I developed this passion, you know, as a non-reader, and I have to tell you, I probably read three research papers in my entire training up to that time. I was totally uninterested in medicine. But as I was learning the importance of diet, we had the uh, Hawaii State Medical Library on the grounds of the Queens Medical Center where my residency was. And in my free time, I started just going to the library, seeing whether or not anybody else had seen a connection between diet and disease. And my eyes were just so open. And I'd come home and I'd say, Mary, you know, we'd already decided, I think, that we couldn't eat beef. I came home and I said, Mary, you know, we've got to stop eating chicken and fish they're the same as beef. I mean, after all, they're muscles. You know, one muscle happens to move a limb, another one flaps a wing, and another one wiggles a tail. They're all muscles. We must give it up. And your response? Well, since I grew up mostly with casseroles and things like that, and, and those things were not really part of my um, main dish thing, I figured, well, and especially this was in the late 70s, there were a lot of vegetarian cookbooks out there and they relied heavily on cheese and eggs. And so I picked up quite a few of those and I just gave up the meat and substituted um, dairy and eggs for a while. Until I, <laughs> until I went to the library. <laughs> and I believe me, I spent uh, uh, lots of hours there. I mean, I would, I would only guess I would spend 20 to 40 hours a week at the library reading. And then I came home and I told Mary that uh, dairy was liquid meat and we had to give it up. And you were, you were very gracious about that. <laughs> you said, okay, it's no big deal. And uh, well, you know, in the small town that we lived in, there was, there was uh, an actual, what they called health food store. And it was, a big store, it's called Earthseed, and it was owned by some friends of ours, and you walked in it, and there were big, round, plastic bins that held beans and grains and all these different things that I had no idea what they were. So I started experimenting um, with these things that were in the bins and um, had quite a few disasters. <laughs> yes. But uh, I learned that what was most successful was to take some of our old favorites and substitute the beans for the beef and uh, um, not use dairy and use other things for flavorings. And that's um, basically how I started uh, working on recipes. And then, and then I started doing more research. And I found out the toxic effect of vegetable oils. You know, the fat you eat, the fat you wear, causes horrible obesity. I, you know, discovered that these were the strongest carcinogens, cancer promoters of all components of food were vegetable oils. And uh, that they cause bleeding problems and suppress the immune system. And so I came home and I said, Mary, <laughs> we got to give up the oil. And that day I almost lost my happy home. I figured, how can I cook? without oil, which is how a lot of people feel when they first hear us tell them, you know? And so I learned to saute in vegetable broth. I learned to, to substitute vegetable broth for oil. I, I learned to add seasonings for flavor. Um, but it wasn't an instant learn. It took me a lot of time in the kitchen. I mean, now, 40 years later, it doesn't seem like a big deal because I can go and put something on without even thinking about it. But at the time, it was a really big deal. So I, I was uh, still in my residency. Some, you know, some days the cars didn't work and I had to take the bus. But uh, you know, just <laughs> like all of you, when you first started out in life, things were really difficult financially. But we had a great time together. We had two children. And uh, then uh, when we were in Montawilly, up next to the mountains, uh, there are two things that I would like to share with uh, people. One is uh, our youngest our son, which is our second child, Patrick, he developed uh, difficult problems with his uh, ears, yes. allergies. Well, we lived right up next to the mountains in Montawilly, and it was very mold-laden. And that was probably the cause. But we wanted to find out if there was something we could do to help Patrick. 
And there are a couple of things I did. One was I refused to have ear tubes put in because I knew it was quackery as it is now. And I also uh, used uh, uh, something, an insuffl insufflation technique where you blow air through the nose into the ears. And that got him through his ordeal. But we also tried a gluten-free gluten diet. Gluten-free diet. Yeah. That, for a couple of weeks. So I learned how to make gluten-free recipes. Uh, it didn't help Patrick. It didn't, didn't help Patrick at all. He just kind of grew out of it. Uh, but we also moved away from the, the Rainy Mountains. Yeah, we moved away Down from into the Rainy the Mountains. Area. But before we moved, I, I believe you also got pregnant again. Yes. And uh, even though the, all this information that I'd shared with Mary, uh, you know, she knew well and I knew well. Uh, she got pregnant and uh, I didn't say anything about our, our eating, but uh, quickly came back into our diet, dairy and some no, fish. No, I don't think dairy. Fish. Fish did. Fish yeah. or maybe some chicken or something. Oh, I don't know. Well, for maybe. The, the impression I think that happened then is, well, okay, we could eat this way. We could feed our kids this way, but you being pregnant. Yeah. You know, it was just too much of a risk considering what everybody knew. So you added these things back. I said nothing. Uh, you know, these are, of course, very sensitive times in our lives. And three months later, you had a miscarriage. And, yeah. and because of that, uh, it at least convinced her that adding fish in, I think there was dairy, but uh, chicken back to the diet didn't... Uh, didn't guarantee a, a positive outcome in terms of your pregnancy. You lost the baby. Right. So anyway, we uh, moved from Mono Willie. We moved uh, Mary found. It was your, your effort. You found a, almost a beachside place in Kailua. We lived seven houses from the beach. But it wasn't nice. It, was, it needed a lot of work. Well, we couldn't. <laughs> so, have, it was 100, 100, we couldn't afford anything nice. So. $165,000. Yeah. Almost beachside in Hawaii. <laughs> But anyway, uh, so we lived there for quite a few years. That's why I learned to windsurf. And, uh, well, we, we moved away when Craig was four and a half, and he was born right after we moved there. So we lived there about four and a half, four and a half, years. And a half years. So we had our, our last uh, child that we've talked about, Craig, many times. Many of you know Craig McDougal. We had him when we lived there. But at that time, our diet was really strict. Yeah. And, uh, by that time, uh, we had... Uh, we follow the same diet we do now. And I kind of date 1977 to the time when we really changed our diet. At that time, I had an office practice in Kailua and I was taking care of patients. And the problem is, is we had no recipes for them. <laughs> so it was your obligation I, that I placed on you and you, or you accepted it willingly, was to uh, uh, not only invent, but type out recipes, which we then copied on a mimeograph machine. Yeah. If you remember those, you gotta be really old to remember those. <laughs> And we'd hand them out in the office. <clears throat> I would take care of patients in this office setting. At the same time as I was giving lectures at St. Francis Hospital for the public, I got a radio show on KA, uh, boy, oh boy, I don't even remember. But anyway, the, the biggest radio, talk radio sh uh, show in Honolulu. So I would have a weekly radio show and we would hold these classes uh, at St. Francis Hospital and we got a big following. Yeah. Uh, and we, we all used to have potluck dinners. We used to have potluck dinners. Uh, the reason is, is because of my follow-up business was so terrible. Uh, people came to see me and they either said, this McDougal is absolutely nuts. I'm never going to see him again. Or they followed the diet. And then what would happen is they'd come back the next week and they'd be better. And I'd take them off more pills. And they'd come up back the next week and I'd take them off more pills. And then they'd come back, you know, a couple weeks later and they'd say, why am I seeing you? I'm not sick anymore and I'm not taking any pills. So I lost those patients. So as a way of keeping contact with our patient population, we had potluck dinners uh, every month at uh, a community center, uh, uh, at a public uh, park center, yeah. or at our yacht club. We, uh, yacht club. Yeah, we, we, went, we belonged to the uh, Conneo Yacht Club where we kept our sailboat. And uh, we actually had Nathan Pritikin as a guest with the 250 people showed up and Nathan Pritikin had a potluck dinner with our patients. And he said uh, that was uh, the best food that he'd ever had. And uh, as we walked out of the parking lot with Nathan and Eileen, his wife, uh, Mary took a hundred of her recipes and gave them to Nathan and said, uh, you're welcome to use these. 
And in his next book, The Critic and Promise, he gave an acknowledgement to John and Mary McDougall for their contribution. It was an incorrect acknowledgement. It should have been to Mary McDougall because <laughs> a good share of the recipes in The Critic and Promise were from Mary's and the uh, the Pritikin Center, which was in Santa Monica, they, they changed uh, their whole style of cooking. And I do believe it was due to Mary's influence. And it became from a place known as uh, unpalatable, unsustainable, to a place that serves some pretty decent food in Santa Monica. Right. It was Santa Monica then. Yeah, I think so. Wasn't it right on the beach? It was, it was yeah, it was on the beach. We visited Nathan Yeah, a we few went times, there one time. Times. So anyway, we uh, we stayed there for 15 years total in Hawaii, three years on yeah. the Big Island, and uh, the rest of the remaining 12 years were on Oahu, the one year initially and the 11 years afterwards. And by that time, I had gotten a law on informed consent passed for breast cancer, which forced doctors to tell women uh, about their options to breast cancer. That made me very unpopular. In fact, so unpopular that they took my malpractice insurance away. Even though I had never had a complaint against me in all my careers of practice, and to date I've only had one complaint against me, and that was from Veronica Atkins, Robert Atkins' wife, after he died. <laughs> but they took my medical malpractice away, which meant I lost my hospital privileges. And so I, here I am trying to support a family of three, not able to do any more hospital admissions, having no malpractice insurance, and not knowing what to do to survive. And uh, I got a call from St. Helena Hospital in the Napa Valley, where they were, this is a Seventh-day Adventist hospital, where they were trying to do uh, what Ellen White had taught them to do more than 100 years ago, which is to treat people with a vegetarian diet. And they asked me if I'd come over and interview and see about possibly taking over a program that they had already started, which was a complete failure, in terms of no people coming, not because it didn't work. <laughs> And so we agreed to move, and they gave us ten thousand dollars to move. Yeah, and they, well, then they paid our moving expenses. Well, that was our moving expenses. Oh, that was our moving <laughs> that expenses. Was okay. And uh, we bought the home that we live in now, the one we're broadcasting from, and that was thirty years ago. Yeah. It was nineteen eighty-seven. We bought that house. Yeah. And uh, I worked at Saint Lena Hospital then for the next sixteen years. Uh, it's hard to believe. <laughs> yeah, for sixteen, and we saw. I saw probably. 3,000 people at the hospital. And as I've told many of you, uh, I was uh, respected, uh, I think liked, I mean, I actually flew airplanes with one of the cardiovascular surgeons. We were both pilots and you're a pilot also. So, uh, uh, so they liked me, but they <laughs> never sent me a patient in 16 years. I never got a referral at St. Louis Hospital in 16 years. Although I did refer a few of my patients to them the GI specialists, the heart specialists, and so on, because it was good medical practice to get second opinions. But somehow, and I gave two grand rounds at St. Lena Hospital in the Napa Valley, two times I was invited to noon, standing room only when I was there, let me tell you. I said, at least during one of those presentations, if not both, I said, I was very curious, considering what I do, which is to treat dietary diseases, I think it's very curious that no one in the Napa Valley, none of your patients have dietary diseases. And the reason I know that is you have not referred a single patient to me in 16 years. They were embarrassed, but they never challenged me. And uh, after 16 years, I tried to expand the program by bringing in uh, the multiple sclerosis patients from Roy Swank. And I thought it was a win-win deal. We weren't seeing that many people. I mean, a good sized program was 12 people. The program we start, tomorrow is uh, with companions, I think 42 people. Yes. Our typical program is about 40 people. Sometimes we run 50. But the best program I think I ever ran it, as far as numbers at St. Helena, and I was on uh, Larry King. I was, uh, you know, New York Times national best-selling author. Uh, believe me, I was well known at that time. I think the highest number of program we ran was 23 people. Now, I didn't <laughs> understand why, but the reason is, I believe, is people couldn't relate health with a hospital. <laughs> and they were right. I mean, sick people went to the hospital. And besides, they ran an alcohol rehab center there. And I think they were embarrassed when they told their friends they went to St. Lena to get well, that they were somehow coming for 
drug addiction or alcohol abuse uh, treatment, but uh, they were coming to my program. So it never really succeeded, but I didn't care because I was out selling books. I was on national best-selling uh, book lists. And so I could support my family. Uh, actually, I was a book salesman. That's how I supported <laughs> you and the kids was selling books. Uh, anyway, we uh, stayed at St. Lena Hospital 16 years. I had a great staff. We accomplished a lot. We published our results in one of the... Uh, uh, in one, one of the journals, you can look it up. We published our results on 500 people. Still did not impress my colleagues. So in uh, 2002, I tried to bring in new patients because Roy Swank, uh, the head of neurology of OHSU, was uh, basically done. He'd run two programs with it at St. Helena Hospital with his MS patients. And I came to the administration and I said, uh, I want to bring in Dr. Swank's patients. It's a win-win situation. Uh, we get more patients. We help people. After all, we're a hospital. You're an Adventist hospital. You believe in good nutrition. How could you object? This is absolutely sounds like a wonderful relationship. And I was told no. And I sat down with my health center director and I said, why not? She says, we don't want MS patients here. I said, why not? She said, we don't want to be associated with MS patients. And I thought to myself, oh, what is this like? Uh, you know, people don't want to be associated with cancer patients because they never get well. You know, there's a stigma is what I heard him say. And I said, well, what do we do, need to do? Do we, do we need to take care of models and baseball players? Is that what we want to do to get our reputation? We're a hospital. We want to take care of sick people. And they wouldn't budge. And we went up through the administration. And they wouldn't budge. They weren't going to allow me to add. So my contract was up in five days. And I put... And conveniently. Big, conveniently. I put in big letters V O I D and handed it to him. And uh, oh, by the way, before that, I'd asked for an appointment with the Jolene. Her name was Jolene. Yeah. Uh, I forgot her last name, but I asked an appointment with the head of the hospital to discuss this. And she said she couldn't see me for a month and a half. So I dropped that on their desk and I <laughs> they said they wanted to see me tomorrow. So the next day I walked in, I sat down, they said, uh, started talking to me about why I should stay and so on. And they looked at me and I just sat there. And they said, we're not going to change your mind, are we? And I said, no, you're not. Now, uh, there were two things going through their mind, I believe. One, they believed that the McDougall program could not exist without their medical structure, the St. Lena Hospital and the Adventist Healthcare System. They believed I couldn't do this on my own. Yet by that time, I'd run programs for Blue Cross Blue Shield of Minnesota, and we'd shown a 40% uh, reduction in healthcare costs. Did that in Minneapolis or outside of Minneapolis. And I'd run programs for uh, public supermarkets in uh, Lakeland, Florida. We'd run several programs for both of these, yet St. Lady didn't believe I could exist without them. Also, what I realize now, which I believe to be absolutely the underlying true factor, is they could see no way to make money off of taking care of MS patients with diet. 80% of the income of that hospital, as your hospital, came from treating heart patients. They were known as the second best bypass surgery unit in the state of California. And they had really no interest in expanding their efforts in terms of taking care of nonprofit care, of, even though they're Adventist, even though their religious mission statement was to do this. They refused to do it, and I believe it was totally because of profit. But we had a lot of arguments, St. Lena and I did. Uh, <laughs> Mary wouldn't even come in and eat there. Well, I did a few times. But I only lectured there, what, once or twice each program? Well, but, once. but why wouldn't you come in and eat with us? Well, the food wasn't very good. The food was terrible. And why was the food terrible? Well, because they made it in the hospital kitchen, and they would never take any input from me on how to make the recipes tastier. And even so, I even hired outside professional chefs to come in and work with them. And they just, you know, a hospital can't make food. Even today, I don't believe they can make food. Probably not. We got in a big argument at one time. Um, and I wanted to make food taste better at St. Helena. And so I asked them if I insisted we use some spice and some pepper and some vinegar. Well, these are against Adventist dietary principles. No vinegar. No vinegar, no pepper. No pepper. Yeah. Yeah. So we had a meeting together, the administration, you know, 
all of them that were important. And I, we sat down together and to discuss this fact that they allow no spice in my food. I mean, I had no oil, no meat, no dairy, and they would allow me no spice. So I sat with them and I said, why do you do this? I said, uh, considering the fact that uh, I can go one floor up and I can find in the nurse's station, I can find coffee and donuts and everything else. I can go to the next cafeteria over where you feed the employees and I can find Tabasco sauce, which is, uh, which is uh, vinegar and spice. I said, uh, you know, why is it that you're uh, not allowing me to use these condiments to make my food taste okay? Well, they could come back with no decent answer, especially when I put it in the realm of the fact that they were violating all of their dietary principles, at least half of them. <laughs> and so I want to tell you, for the next three programs, you couldn't eat the potatoes in the morning. They were so loaded with pepper. <laughs> anyway, we left in 2002. We started running our program at the Flamingo Resort, which we will have been successfully. In uh, May of 2002. May, May of 2002, right. So added up that's almost 15 years yeah so we've been at at the flamingo for almost as long as he was in, at st helena which is really pretty amazing almost 30 years that we've been doing this yeah in, a, in an institutionalized situation well uh st helena hospital or excuse me uh, uh the flamingo first of all they didn't believe that we were going to be a permanent yeah. uh, part of their hotel and, and we're, we're of course the major uh, income of the flamingo resort as far as a single unit goes. And uh, uh, they have been a, a very welcome home. But when we started, you had to help them out. You uh, Well, became... Heather and I spent a lot of time in the kitchen. Um, we developed all the recipes and um, we would go into the kitchen and, and before every meal and taste the food to make sure that the chefs made it right. Um, so all the recipes they use are mine and now, of course, I don't have to do that, except once in a while when I give them a new one, you know, I have to make sure that they get it right. And um, it still doesn't taste exactly like I make it at home, but close. it's close. I used, to sit at, I used to sit at the table at St. Lina Hospital in our dining room section, which was shared by the alcoholics and drug addicts. We had our own <laughs> table. The drug addicts used to come over and bring a piece of uh, cheesecake over to our participants and say, oh, don't, I, don't you wish you could have this? And I would tell our participants, why don't you get a glass of vodka or a pack <laughs> of cigarettes and go over to their table? But anyway, it, it, of course, it, it was it was a great experience, but a lot of uh, a lot of difficulty working in an environment that didn't really want you, uh, which was the case at St. Helena. They've tried to resurrect my program on many occasions since I left with no success, no success. No success. success. But uh, I, would I would sit at the table at St. Helena, I'd say, I, I wish, and I would even sometimes say this to the participants, I wish I could take you home and show you what the food really tastes like. And so when we moved to the Flamingo, I said to you, I said, no matter what you do, and it <laughs> took you 11 months, I remember 11 months of going in there almost daily, and Heather also, yeah. whatever you do, I want this food to taste like it does when when you make it at home and it's pretty darn close uh yeah you, know, you, you you always prefer your most familiar cooking it's just like we have about six uh burrito places in town that are run by the same friend of ours uh same Emiliano, family same, uh, Emiliano yeah. and his family and they all are supposed to be the same recipes but you go to one of the restaurants and you taste the burritos mcdougal burritos and you go to El Patio, the original one, completely, almost completely different. Certainly, there's no question we prefer Emiliano's original El Patio. So to make it exactly like at home uh, would be impossible, but it's darn close. So well, when, but they're making, the, the thing is when, when you make food, it's they're making it for 60 people, yeah. and it has to sit in a warmer, you know, for... A couple of hours before it's served and so it's never like it's just fresh cooked at home they make it you know several hours ahead of time and then they put it in a warmer and then when it's put into the big chafing dishes on the buffet table 
there's a, a heater underneath this. So everything that I choose for the menu that we serve the people has to be something that I know will sit well on, on a buffet table for a couple of hours and still be, and still taste good. So I, I have to choose my dishes, not based on um, our favorites at home, but on what will sit on the buffet table. Whereas you would not come to St. Helena and eat. No, I would not. Not, not by <laughs> choice. Not. I was there when, you had, when, to give when a I had to give a lecture, yes. We eat, uh, we eat uh, many of our meals, uh, and there's none that we were disappointed in. During the program, Mary and I are there for lunch and dinner for many of the meals. Um, yeah. We will be next week. In fact, it's a chance, of course, for you not to, not have, to, to have to cook. cook. <laughs> and we take food home. And, yeah. So we've run this program uh, for... Uh, since 19, or 2002 at uh, the Flamingo Resort with tremendous success. You know, we've published results on 1,615 people from 10 years of this uh, program showing phenomenal, undeniable, never questioned results, just like we published on 500 people at St. Helena Hospital. And uh, you mentioned that you serve sometimes 40, 50, 60 people during the program. On our weekends, we'll have as many as 300 people. Yes, yeah, and then, of course. But it's the same food. It's just that they have to make larger amounts. And, again, this has to be something that will stay uh, fresh and – and. Uh, but it always turns out. It always turns out well. We, we, right? the, the reserve does a phenomenal job. But uh, they realize, too, uh, or they should realize, just like St. Helena Hospital should realize – that we can pick up this program, we can move it in 72 hours to any 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 hotel in the world. So uh, they work hard to make sure that they were happy and they they, they do a phenomenal job. When people and they will arrive starting tomorrow, yeah. come to the same yeah. the Saint Lena, they pull into a parking lot with a revolving flamingo <laughs> on the roof, and they go, "My goodness, what did I get myself into? This is going to be." It takes them about four days, and then they realize what a great resort we're at yeah. and uh, how well they're taken care of. The major changes that we've made in, since 2002 have not been many. I mean, when we first started out, we did everything, including almost cleaning the bathrooms, you yeah. and I. Yeah. But uh, <clears throat> well, we 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 brought in different speakers. We brought in Jeff Novick. Uh, Doug, Doug Lyle came with us originally. Yeah. Uh, they wouldn't hire Doug Lyle at St. Helena Hospital, and the reason they gave me was too, he was too smart and too threatening uh, because he was so smart. I just love that when they shared that story with me. So Doug Lyle works, uh, has worked with us since we've been at uh, the Flamingo Resort. Jeff came a few years later. Major changes were that instead of you, do, you and I doing everything, Heather took over. And it was, it was a, a, a growing process, but now uh, – I mean, she, she has improved the program so much. The website, she controls everything. Every aspect of the program, my schedule, she tells me when I get up and do my song and dance, and Mary also, and when the doctor's appointments are. And so Heather runs everything. Yeah. And uh, that's been that's been a, a, an amazing, wonderful change for us to have her involved. Yeah. And well, then, she couldn't do that until her children grew up. So, um, well, she couldn't do it until she matured herself. Uh, that's you probably know, true, also. It's it, like all of us, she's grown and uh, she's 42 now. Yeah, believe me, she runs the program and has leadership, and everything goes well. Then, the second major change we made you might be able to add something else is we had uh, added Dr. Anthony Lim two years ago, and people thought I quit seeing patients, but that's not true. It's just that they have the addition of Anthony Lim. So I see every patient. In fact, this time, because Dr. Lim is going on a, uh, uh, a pre-committed event, I will be seeing all the patients by myself uh, during the last visit. During the last visit. And I can still do it. No, I know you can. <laughs> and that'll be a matter of seeing 18 people a day, more than 18 a day, for two days. But I'm in good health, and I really enjoy what I do, so. Anyway, people ask us about 2000s. Oh, I got to make one other note. All right, what is it? Today is the day, 40 years ago, that Elvis Presley died. <laughs> okay. And we were big fans. In fact, we missed the one. No, it can't be. This is his birthday. This is his birthday. He died in August because I didn't know I, because I was 
vacation. Oh, okay. Well, today is Elvis Presley's birthday. Yes. But he died 40 years ago. Yeah. And I can remember driving home from, it was 1977, from my residency program and buying one of the few papers I ever bought from a street vendor mm. with the headlines that Elvis Presley died. And what I thought, I can tell you, I am to be guilty of the same thing today when I see each and every one of you or I see people at a restaurant or I see friends of ours that we meet. I thought the same thing. I thought, oh my goodness, I could have saved him. You know, he died of a dietary disease. And I just, and, and you think I say that with just words. I mean, it was emotion that I felt that I had lost, you know, my favorite singer and one of the greatest people in the music business uh, who will always be remembered. I thought it was such a stupid, stupid, simple solution. The man would be alive today and he'd been 82 years old. Yeah. yeah. But you never get the chance. I mean, all these people that we see that are stars. Well, some people give and, you a chance. Well, some people do, but, you know, there are so many people that we see walking down the street or, um, you know, stars or media, people that are in the media, and we think, wow, if, if we could only help them, they would be so much healthier, and um, it would improve their lives so much. And also the Latino family at Costco that's yeah. fat and sick with kids that can't afford the can't afford the, the, the things they have on the yeah. checkout line. Yeah. You know, I mean, it, it hurts us every place, every day when we go and, it, you know, we read stories or, you know, we meet people in the shopping center. We just think, and it's not just words. We just think, oh, my goodness. And they all think it's too difficult. When they hear it the first time, remember, if you go back and listen to this whole interview we did, just remember what we went through. Yeah. To yeah. make these kind of changes. Yeah. Well, Mary, it, you know, it's been the best 45 years of my life. We're going to have to end here. I, the, the title of this presentation is what's going to happen uh, in 2017 in the future. Well, you didn't tell them. Well, do you have any thoughts? I, I, you must. I, you know you have some thoughts because, you see, Mary works about uh, 10 to 12 hours a day as <laughs> I do. And one of her jobs is taking care of the books. She won't let anybody else touch the money, of course, for obvious reasons. And so she takes care of all the payroll, all the 1099s, uh, you know, everything with the, uh, with, the, with the books. But the other thing she does is she works again, and I'm not exaggerating, 8 to 12 hours a day. In addition to the financial part of the business and the fact that you lecture several times during the program, you're always by my side. And uh, uh, you also run these adventure travel trips. And I, and I, you know, Mary's 70, and I'll be 70 in a few months. And people are retired at age 65, and they keep telling me, Mary, <laughs> you know, we should cut back and, you know, do less and stop doing adventure programs. And you, you kind of say the same thing. And then I we, do say And we both throw thing. up our hands and say, well, what would we do? What would we do? We have nothing to do. So I, this is going to be our first announcement. I'm going to, you know, you didn't, I didn't tell you I was going to announce it. Oh, okay. But you, you decided to do it, and I know it's going to go through. We have a trip in three weeks, which is totally sold out. You know, 145 people, including... Gustavo that are going to Kauai with us, my brother Bill and his family. And Heather and her family. And Heather and her family are going. It's an amazing trip. You missed it. You missed the Kauai trip. We will likely never go back there again to the Kauai Sheridan. But you never know. We promised we'd never go back to Hawaii again. Yeah, I know. We went to Alaska with the grandkids. We took 62 people to Alaska uh, in June this July of this past year. Yeah, June of 2016. Yeah, we took an amazing, amazing trip. It wasn't cheap, but uh, the people who went on that trip, I think, to a person would tell you that's the best vacation they ever had. So anyway, Mary and I have thought about cutting back and stopping, et cetera, et cetera, but there's nothing for us to do. You know, we, we just live our business and our life is work and being together and doing the job, so we're not going to quit. So we made a, a two-year plan. And no. that, yeah, yeah to your plan, yeah. and uh, so this will this will take us up until we're 72, and you folks have a lot of time to get involved if you want. We'll continue to run 10-day programs at least six a year, and we run two uh, 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 two commercial programs for businesses. Yes, and uh, we'll run more of those, and we run uh, a intensive weekend in May. We're thinking of adding another intensive weekend. And we run advanced study weekends. It'll be one February 10th through 12th of 2017. Don't miss it. I have to tell you, we're not going to live broadcast it. 
So you, you have an opportunity to be there live. You will not see the usual live broadcast. Later on, we plan to put it up that you can purchase that weekend. But if you want the, uh, the immediate energy of the event, show up uh, February 10th, 2017. You can sign up on the website. And then I, I'm going to announce okay. for the first time. Okay. I have no reason to not think it's going to be true. We have two more trips planned. Uh, in two th June of 2018, we're going to take you back to Alaska. Same line, National Geographic. They have made amends for Rupert uh, Murdoch, Rupert Murdoch, <laughs> the global warming denier. They have made amends for him because I've never told him I'd never go back on one of their trips. Because but of they the, have since put out yeah, several um, documentaries National Geographic has on the global warming and climate change, and so um, we feel that that they are uh, reputable on the in line company, with our thinking. In line with our thinking. You know, like Leonardo DiCaprio's uh, uh, Before the Flood. Yes, that was produced by National Geographic. Amazing. You ought to see it. So we're going back to Alaska in June of 2018. I will tell you right now, that trip will sell out like the last one within 48 hours. So if you have any interest, you should let Carol. We can only take 62 people. Well, 62 people, yeah. So, and then, no, not even, because our family goes. Yeah, Heather and the kids so, will be. Uh, you know, probably 56 people. <laughs> so if you have an interest, uh, you should email Carol at uh, carol at drmcdougall.com and tell her you want to put on be put on the pre-waiting list. Yeah, the pre-waiting list, yeah. yeah <laughs> because it will go that fast. And then we're going to go on to another trip on the Big Island in uh, January 2018. Yes. And we're probably going to go back to the Montelani. We're still negotiating with them. We have a few deals. They didn't do the food as well as we liked last time, and they're going to do it right this time. But we have a few things that we have to work out with the Montelani. So, and it, they have beautiful views oh, from all their rooms. All so, ocean view um, rooms. Uh, and, and a great location, and very quiet and private. And so probably in the Montelani, um, possibly the Marriott. We haven't decided yet. Decide. Or, you know, I always like to share it. You don't, but I. But I don't. Uh, they don't have a beach. They, they, had, great, a beach. they had great food. They had great, they had great food. So we will uh, <laughs> probably do that in January of 2018. Again, if you want to go, uh, this trip sold out to look to Kauai that we're doing in three weeks. Yeah. It'll sell out. And we'd love to have you along. And uh, likewise, the advanced study weekends often sell out. We don't have any rooms. So I would encourage you to uh, call the 800 number, 800-941-7111. That's 800-941-7111. Uh, or write, better yet, write, send Carol an email note at carol at drmcdougall.com. Well, here we are, 45 <laughs> great years later. 45 years later. 45 years <laughs> and later. by the way, folks, not without a few bumps. <laughs> but uh, my best friend for 45 years. and. Uh, we hope to have 70, 90. Heimlich died at 96. I never got to talk about him, but let's just plan on 90. All right. So, <laughs> anyway, at least, he, at least another 15 years of hard work. Uh, Gustavo, thank you. For, uh, we didn't give you a lot of chance for input, but I, I wanted to spend a little time talking to people about where Mary and I have been and we hope to go. We've got our greatest gift to us is our grandkids. How many do we have now? Seven, 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 grand, seven grandkids. We have a family of 15. Uh, I just wish all of you as much happiness, uh, productivity. Family. Well, we have more than 15. Do you think so? I think so. Let's see. There's you and I, three kids. Yeah. And there's three in laws. And there's three in laws. So how many is that? That's eight. Oh, and that's seven eight. grandkids. Okay. 15. 15. So they're 15. You're right. And <laughs> I never was very good at math. <laughs> well, and, uh, it, the kids tell us no more, but I believe one more is on the way. Um, I think all of the audience here, including me, um, have appreciated this very unusual webinar, Dr. McDougall, where we get a window to, to, to your life together and what you've done and what you're doing and what your plan is. And I, I thank you for the, the surprise. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody is writing down here how wonderful this webinar has been. So, thank well, you. Well, we enjoyed uh, talking to you. It was a surprise to Mary, too. She had no idea what I was going to say. I had no idea. As always in life, uh, we're both full of surprises. I, I, someday I'll have to tell you about the things that she surprised me with 
flight, learning how to be twin engine IFR rated pilots and owning two airplanes. That was your fault. <laughs> <laughs> so it's been an exciting life to say the least. Uh, and it will continue as we plan for at least 15 more productive years. All right, right. Yeah. Well, I know that we haven't had time for questions today, so that's fine because we have, you know, we have many webinars coming up, but some of the people have questions I can see here that are answered in your website. So I just want to encourage them to go and look at our past webinars that we've done and, and your newsletters and other videos because they can get all the information for free there. That's right. And yes. thank you, Gustavo. I look forward to seeing you in three weeks. All right, me too. You know, yeah. Mary and I uh, made a good friend a couple of years ago, and and I know you're uh, you're enjoying the relationship too. Yes, very much. This is very special to me, and I am counting the days until January 28th when I leave. Uh, uh, yes, January 20th. Great food. Uh, so, Dr. Mcdula, next week we have Dr. Lyle as a guest, and the following week, I think we I think uh, we're start are we starting the this with you. You know, we could. We could start the digestive tune-up. Uh, the only thing is, is that I don't have a free copy for people. Okay. They have to buy a copy of it either at Whole Foods or at their bookstore or on Amazon. Uh, if I had access, it's still uh, under copyright with the publishing company. If I had access, I'd give it to you. But I don't, so I can't. Okay. So well, we we that, the other thing I, I thought about doing is the women's book, which I do have free access to. Oh, okay. Well, we might do that then instead. But we'll let everybody else know in just a, a, a few days. All right, folks. Well, thanks for uh, for listening to our story. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for listening. Oh, no, thank, <laughs> thank you. And, and then, happy New Year to all of you. Yep. Same to you. All right. Very talk good. To, talk to you in a couple we'll weeks. Bye bye. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Bye bye.